I'll call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the North Hills Public School Board. It's Monday, May 23rd, 2011. Dr. Richardson, are there agenda changes? Uh, yes, if you look in your table file, you'll see that we have a number of additional personnel items, including appointments, an increase, decrease, or change in assignment. We also have the uh, approval for the charter school contract between Northfield Public Schools and Prairie Creek Community Schools. And you remember earlier we had a presentation and I've completed the evaluation of the school and we're prepared now to uh, offer uh, a five-year contract that will allow us to continue to authorize them <coughs> the 2016, end of the 2016, 15, 16 school year. We also have a grant from SPED Forms. Uh, and again, if you remember last year, we had a similar grant, uh, which provides an opportunity for uh, Dr. Gary Lewis to work on upgrading the quality of the SPED Form materials that are used by our special education staff. And uh, in doing that, we'll not only provide support for our own school district, but also for SPED Forms and dollars for that are, are uh, gifted to the district and then we're able to uh, pay Gary to do those kinds of services during the summer months. Okay, All right. if there's no objection, we'll add those items to the agenda as we move forward. We have opportunity now for public comment and this is a chance for members of the school district to address the board. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board? Okay. Seeing no one come forward, we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Um, board members, you have in your packet the minutes of the regular meeting held on May 9th, 2011. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Moved by Ellen, second by Jeff. Any discussion, comments? Okay. All those in favor of approving the minutes of the regular meeting held on May 9th, 2011, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Motion carries. Those minutes are approved. On to announcements and recognitions. Dr. Richardson? Okay, uh, the first item that we have for announcements and recognitions, we'd uh, like to ask uh, Nancy and Rusty Kluber and Corby Urban from Monsanto to come forward. And basically th they are going to be presenting uh, to the school district tonight uh, on behalf of America's Farmers Grow Communities program, a check uh, to the uh, school Could district. You, come to the podium? you just come right to the podium, it's fine. And basically, uh, they'll be sharing a little bit of information about uh, the program and a little bit about what uh, the plans are for, for the uh, $2,500 amount. And then um, I think if we, when we get done with that, we can do at least a video photo op, uh, being able to uh, share the checks and we'll have our board chair be the individual that will accept the check for the school district. So Corby, Everybody. it's all yours. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, again, my name is Corby Irvin. I'm a territory sales manager um, for DeKalb and Asgirl. And on behalf of Monsanto, <clears throat> excuse me, it is our, our pleasure to be here tonight uh, presenting this award. So the American, Grows, uh, American Farmers Grow Communities Award uh, was started about two years ago. And this award is intended um, to recognize farmers and the contributions that they give to their local communities. And without their contributions, you know, the school wouldn't be here. Uh, a lot of stuff in the, in the community would not be here. So on behalf of Monsanto, um, we started the program to include Minnesota in this, uh, this past year. And each county, uh, there was, I think, 50,000 growers throughout the, the U.S that signed up for this award and um, uh, one was selected per county and uh, this was by um, um, just a, a random selection that uh, Rusty and Nancy were uh, selected for uh, this check and um, they selected uh, Northfield School District for the, the recipient and so it's on behalf of, of Rusty and Nancy it is Monsanto's privilege to present this check to Northfield School District, <coughs> and with that, we'll let uh, uh, Rusty and Nancy kind of share uh, what their what their plans are to do um, with this money. So, okay. uh, I, I'm I am Rusty Kluver, 
Um, it's interesting, not only do I farm, but I also uh, teach sixth grade in the school district also, so I guess I sort of uh, straddle uh, both sides of this situation. And I want to say that uh, when we won this award, there was no doubt that uh, I wanted to give it to the Northfield School District. And uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased about that, but we've had uh, two children graduate uh, from Northfield High School. I'm a graduate of Northfield High School, and I <coughs> just want to say that I think it's because uh, we've had such wonderful teachers in this district, and they've really, uh, I know our children, they've really, uh, really encouraged them to excel. And so we'd like this money to go to a, a scholarship um, it's going to be put into a scholarship fund uh, for someone in the uh, getting a four-year degree in the sciences. video photo opportunity and also I see patches here and we'll get a couple of other pictures so look at a family photo now look at me <laughs> <laughs> Good to go. Good. Okay. okay. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. More announcements. Yes. And and again, Rusty and Nancy, thank you so much. We really appreciate your thought on this. And again, we will put it to good use for the students in this district. So thanks again so much. And Corby, thank you so much for representing Monsanto on this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we also have a full page of other announcements, so let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, first of all, Northfield Middle School held its, eighth, uh, its annual 8th grade awards night on May the 19th. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education recognized 109 of our students with either the President's Award for Educational Excellence or the President's Award for Academic Achievement. An additional 43 students also earned awards based on Northfield Middle School faculty determined criteria. So again, congratulations to our eighth graders at Northfield Middle School. We also had the middle school family and consumer sciences teacher Jackie Magnuson has been selected by a national panel of her peers to participate in the 2011 professional development program in food science. This program is a product of collaboration between the Food and Drug Administration and the National Science Teachers Association. These organizations will sponsor Jackie's participation in training sessions in Washington, D.C. and in Seattle beginning this summer. We also would like to congratulate Greenville Park teacher Mary Beth Youngblood. She got a Sparks grant and purchased four digital cameras for a classroom. Her students are using cameras to make an alphabet book by finding letters of the alphabet in nature <coughs> in Greenville Park's Lone Oak Nature Center. For example, when her two branches cross, uh, students will take a picture showing the letter X. Some of the pictures they are saying are very creative and I guess we look forward to seeing the entire alphabet book. We'd also like to thank uh, our high school student council who under the direction of Pat Riley uh, organized the annual fifth grade kickball tournament. We had fifth graders had a ball, no pun intended, and demonstrated excellent sportsmanship. I think fun was had by all and for once the weather cooperated on that day. Uh, also, our middle school band concert was held on May the 12th. Ethan Fryer and Paul Beck led the 6th, 7th, and 8th grade graders through many lively and entertaining pieces, highlighting many solos. So, great job to the middle school band. We also would like to congratulate Bridgewater 5th grader Carl Holman for being recipient of the Golden Bow as the result of the Elementary Orchestra Solo Contest. He won the top bass prize that was announced by Karen Madsen at the orchestra concert on May the 17th. 58 students participated in the solo contest. And again, congratulations to all those students and to Carl for winning that prestigious award. Also our Northfield Area Learning Center, small business class, Soy Scent Candles Company, slash, 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 received the Minnesota School of Character and Promising Practices Award. Cheryl Matheson and four students from the small business class 
were honored at the state capitol on the afternoon of Thursday, May the 19th. This award is sponsored by the Center for Academic Excellence and in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Education. The four students are Emily Varnas, Claudia Soto Rangel, uh, Cassandra Lane, and Sari Carrera. And then finally, just a reminder uh, that board members are invited to the graduation ceremony for our Area Learning Center students, which is a week from this Wednesday, June the 1st, at 1 o'clock p.m. in the Longfellow Gymnasium. So please feel free to come and enjoy what is always a very, very positive situation in terms of that graduation for students. So that's all the announcements that I have at this point. Excellent. Anyone else? Anything to add? Okay. On we go. Our first item for discussion is the presentation of the ALC on their professional learning communities. Thank you. Um, I'm Pat Parlin. I'm the director of the Area Learning Center, and as you can hear, there are many great things happening uh, for our students at the ALC. Um, we are here tonight to present um, our PLC information. Um, I have two staff members present that will be doing the um, presentation tonight. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Bert Demos, he's a math teacher, and Ms. Uh, Ms. Darcy Sawyer, who is the social studies teacher. Okay. Hello, I'm Darcy. Um, I'm going to talk, um, let me see if I clear this out. Okay, I'm going to be talking about um, our goals. Um, our first building site improvement plan, as you can see, basically the first one is about daily attendance and trying to um, raise the percent of improvement with the kids, <coughs> with their attendance. Um, and Bert will talk a little bit more about that too, but basically we just had incentives to, um, to get them there. And um, we're pretty happy and proud of some of the ideas that came up in a positive way to get these kids to school. Um, and then the second one basically is academically. This is what our main focus has been this year. And academically is the raising the measure um, for MCA math, reading and writing, and try to increase their scores to passing. Um, and so what we did with that idea, um, I'm going to just talk about three main parts. I'm going to talk about the first one, about the, um, our SMART goals. And then Bert's going to get into the challenges that we face. So the first one is about um, increasing test taking skills on the MCA. And what we wanted to do is just try to increase their reading. And so what we had, what we had done is um, we had something like this that was uh, just a reading component kind of book. And each one, um, it's kind of neat because it was separated into English and there was even a social studies test. And, um, but it's reading comprehension, OK? And so what we found with this, though, was when we did the reading comprehension and did like a pretest with them, we found out one of the main, um, I should say, problems that they ran into was vocabulary. Um, and they, when we reassessed them afterwards and said, you know, what do you think about this test? Because the scores weren't that great. And the kids are saying, some of those words are just hard. Some of them, once they get to a word and they don't understand it, they just kind of give up. Some do. I'm not saying all of them, but some of them just give up. So then we found out, well, okay, um, vocabulary. Let's make this as, as simple as possible. So what we did is um, root words, finding the root of a word. And, it, and then for some kids, it was as simple as even explaining what a root word was. Um, because we thought if they can figure out how a root word root word works, they could figure out what the word means. Okay, so that was been our focus. So um, it's basically 80% increase, getting them to answer more. So we would do a pretest with these root words and then a post test to see what <coughs> they, how the results would be. Um, so oh, I went too far. Sorry. I gotta go back. Um, one more thing I wanted to say with this root weird thing too. Um, we 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 always call ourselves really unique over at the ALC because I'm the only social studies teacher 
We only have one math teacher. We only have one science teacher. Um, so uniquely, we our teaching strategies kind of went up to the individual teacher. Um, one teacher might have kids do PowerPoints with that word, and um, another teacher, teacher might have um, pictures that would go with the root word. Um, I would play games. There's root word games. We all kind of came up with our own little teaching strategies with root words, and so that was kind of a unique way that we use that. And now I'm going to hand it over to Bert. And I do know a few of you, but for the rest of you, I'm Bert Bemmels. I teach math at the ALC. Um, that's a third or fourth rendition of my life, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I always, of course, like to talk about data. And it's important um, um, for PLCs to have accurate data. And we have a bit of a struggle coming up with pertinent data on our students and accurate data. So much of what we have is things we did ourselves. We have students that come to our school with a wide variety of history. You can't really look back and see where they've been and what they've done. They just don't have the information. The ones that come directly from Northfield and have been here all along have a pretty solid trail, but not everyone is like that. And these are the five uh, different goals we've finished this year, and Darcy was talking about that second one a lot, the reading goal. When we gave him that sample reading test, um, the uh, Post-test, they actually did poorer than they did on the pretest, And obviously that was a problem. And as she talked about, when we talked with the students, we found out they don't know. Well, the reason they get them wrong and the reason they give up is they don't know the words. They can't decipher the words. And so we've been working on root words since then. And we de de developed that goal and have used it actually four times. We're on number six now, where we want 80% of our kids to improve from the pre-test to the post-test by at least three of 20 root words. And so they're learning all these root words. The first time we got 73% of our students to improve. The second time we made it to 85, above our goal. The last time it was down a little bit and we're working on number four. Or actually goal six, it's the fourth one of the same thing. And here's a better graph. It's not individual students, it's overall scores. It just shows the in increase the students had from the pretest to the post-test on the third, fourth, and fifth goal we did. And uh, you can see that even though we're only talking about an increase of three for every student, the overall increase is significantly greater than that. So we've got students learning what root words are and how to use them and to their advantage. As we said, the focus for our whole PLC has become this this year. And that's part of the PLC process. You get together, you work as a team. We are only four full-time people and three part-time people that are on our team. And that's the whole team for the whole school. And, but we've drilled it down to the point where um, the students need to pass the reading test in order to graduate. And in order to graduate, they're going to have to um, know a, more words and a bigger vocabulary. And that's what we've been working on. And we will continue to do that. We've already made a commitment to pick that up again in the fall. The last two parts that she talked about are a little different. And you, if you know me, which some of you do, I always have to come up with something a little different. Um, <laughs> the, the challenges that face the ALC and coming up with a, and implementing an appropriate PLC process are many. And I, that highly mobile population is number one on the list. There's some numbers, 8, 18, 14, 5. That's a class I had in my math, my math class last year, third quarter. The first day of class, there were eight students in there. <laughs> During the quarter, it grew to 18. On the last day of the quarter, I had 14. And of those students, for the 40 days that quarter, there was only five students that were there at least 35 days. So when you're trying to teach a group of people in the traditional fashion when they're not there for any length of time, it becomes very difficult. In addition to that, number two, um, the, and I'll talk about my classes again, but it's true for everybody, the incredible disparity in academic achievement is actually phenomenal. I have a class right now where I have a student doing um, third, basically third grade math and in the same room someone's doing pre-calculus. It's real hard to schedule because we're such a small group, so that's, that's a great challenge. 
Okay, now I'm going the wrong way. The outside influences, this is one of the things we determine. In a, in a PLC, you're trying to come up with something. Uh, what's going on in your building? What, what works? What doesn't work? And we found that really, for our students, probably more than any others, what's going on in their life outside of school has a greater impact on their test score than their academic ability sometimes, in fact, many times. And we all teach a variety of different classes in a variety of different ways. We have part-time people that come and go, but if you follow the PLC process, it works. Even in this strange situation, you can make it work. And we believe we have, and we believe we're able to come up with ways, uh, develop ways to teach students in ways they, which they will learn, which is the whole concept behind the PLC. And finally, um, some of you know David Bly, he's retiring this year, he's been at the ALC for many, many, many years. And the disciplines in which we teach and what our students are studying are important. But in our case particularly, the reality is uh, what matters to the individual student. And that's, that's our, always our main focus at the ALC. Questions? Thank you, Bert. Anybody have questions for Bert or Darcy or Pat? I'm sort of wondering about, the, or did you have one? Yeah. Just, you know, how you, what, how you use that time? Are you all together talking about? We have, uh, yeah, we have, what, we have uh, uh, some staff that don't, the part-time staff that aren't in our PLC, but the science teacher who's at the high school in here is there in the morning, so he's in our PLC, as is the special ed teacher we share with the high school. Okay. And um, the art teacher who teaches art at our school and then teaches at St. Dominic's the rest of the day, that's our PLC group, along with David and Darcy and I and Cheryl Matheson. And that's the whole, that's, we meet together for the whole time. And we take the whole time. We run over every time. Go on, yeah. <laughs> We never get out on time. So it's, it's a very uh, involved process. I mean, we are definitely uh, have adopted the PLC model and follow, follow it as best we can to the fullest. Okay. And so that's how it works there. Interesting. Yeah. Anyone else? Good. Well, a very interesting presentation. I, it's, it's been very exciting for us, as this is the first year of implementing PLCs, to hear from the different schools and the different programs, how they're being implemented, and it just sounds like you're making very good use of the time and that it's really working for the students. So, I believe it is. Yes, good. Thank you very much. I was going to say, Kate, can you give us a sense of how many kids will be graduating next week? I, I think I can. Okay. <laughs> it kind of changes daily, but... Understand. <laughs> I, I believe our um, my last count we're at 32, with maybe three more. And, and so okay, it could and be 35. And we have a population right now in the ALC of, <laughs> of, on average, about how many? About 67 students right now. It, it's, very, it's been up to 70, 72. I think right now we're about 66. So the other big thing, and, and I, I know these guys are shy, but the other thing that's really important for, I think, board members to remember is that in many cases, the, the kids that we have here are kids that have just struggled everywhere they've ever been, whether it's been in our district, whether it's been at our tech, whether it's been in another school district in our area, because we are now one of only a few districts, even in the area, that, that provide an ALC program. So we do draw from other districts around us. But the, the thing that I think is the most powerful is, again, as these guys have talked about the testing piece so far, remembering that those MCA tests, they have to pass the math and the reading and the writing MCA tests in order to graduate and get a diploma. And if we're looking at 30 plus kids out of that 60 some student group that have come all the way to that, that point in terms of not only being able to pass MCA tests, but also be able to accumulate all the appropriate credits for graduation, um, given all the things that are there. And I think that's one of the, the, I think the neat things about the graduation ceremony is that usually, um, in fact, always every ceremony I've been in, been to over the last seven years, um, that an individual teacher will talk about each student that's graduating. They'll talk about kind of what issues that particular student was facing. 
and oftentimes it's tremendous challenges um, and I think was shared tonight in terms of all the things going on at home, all the things going on in that student's life that would make lots of kids say, I'm done, you know, I, I'm just not going to do this. But I think what this reflects is how powerful the desire on the part of a lot of kids is to graduate, to get a diploma. They know that without a diploma, they're in deep trouble. Right. And so uh, I think this gives them that last best chance. And I think the teachers that, that uh, have dedicated themselves to making that happen are some pretty special folks. So pretty phenomenal. again, yeah. thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Lisa Malika here from the District Educational Program Advisory Committee, we call it DPAC, with the DPAC goals for 2011 and 12. I'm Lisa Malika and I am a parent of two students at Sibley, a second grader and a third grader. And my third grader has benefited from special ed programming since he was under two years old. So I serve on the Student Support Services subgroup of DPAC. So I'm going to go backwards. <laughs> if you don't know what DPAC is, there it is, District Educational Program Advisory Council. Um, it's a collaborative group of community members, parents, um, the professionals in the school district, as well as um, administrators are around the table. Um, we gather to support the continuous improvement process by providing the Board of Education with the recommended goals that we're presenting tonight. They're, we're comprised of community members, staff members, administrators, and school board members, as you probably know. <laughs> The three subgroups are assessment, curriculum, and staff development, and student support services. So um, during our meetings throughout the year, we've reviewed the assessment of students. Um, Roger has presented a lot of data <coughs> to us um, at different points during the year. We also have seen the student um, Minnesota student survey data, and other um, professionals within the school district have presented data to our group as we work on developing the goals and we always review the goals from the previous year as well. All right, here are our recommendations for this year. From the assessment group, um, this is a two-parter. <laughs> um, students will know their own expected academic goals and understand how to uh, access resources to achieve them. And in other words, and we had a lot of fun with this last Monday night, <laughs> um, students will know and show what they know, what they need to know, and what to do to get there. So um, they wanted to draft this goal so younger students and families with young children, what does this really mean as we're moving forward in the age of assessment and the accountability pieces that are occurring. Um, goal two from the curriculum and staff development subgroup, by the end of the 2011-2012 school year, each building will have in place a building-wide systematic intervention plan that meets the instructional needs of students at their instructional levels. And student support services, we always tend to have three, so. <laughs> um, the district will implement universal screening and progress monitoring of reading skills for all students in grades K through five. Our second goal is the district will adopt and implement a consistent behavioral management system and provide training to all staff across the district and the district will foster school connectedness among students, families, and staff to enhance emotional and social development. And that's a repeat for a few years. Those are the goals. Okay. Very concrete goals this year. Any questions? Oh, thank you, Lisa, and thank you for your work on that committee. Mm -hmm. that's, I used to get to be on that committee. <laughs> it's really, it's, the work that you do is just so important mm -hmm. and very meaty work. Anybody have questions? Uh, Julie. I have a comment, first of all, to thank Lisa because she is actually ending her tenure on DPAC, not by choice, just not able to continue to serve by you've done such a great job. Thank you. And I'm a school board <coughs> member on DPAC and what I've come to appreciate is you know, we have five buildings that all have unique you know, needs and demographics and, and different resources, but this is, DPAC goals are a way of really unifying all five mm -hmm. of our buildings. And, 
you know, making one sort of system when we have many different um, differences, but this is really a unifying, um, unifies our, our building. So I think it's really, I've really come to appreciate the work of DPAC. Mm -hmm. And this goal um, from Student Support Services really talks about that. We're looking at the broader district, and this is one that really addresses that. Mm -hmm. And has that been a goal in the past? This, um, we've worked on um, behavioral management systems throughout the district in bits yeah. and pieces, but now we're looking at, okay, how do we do it across the district? Yeah. Not just within the elementary, but how does that translate from elementary to middle school and then yeah. middle school to high school? Yeah. That's what we're hoping this goal gets to. Yeah. So you've got a consistent language, a kiss, consistent yep. way of About dealing the with line, different behaviors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As they all enter middle school. So. Yeah, very good. Anybody else, any questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much, thank you. Lisa. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody who serves on that committee. It's a, it's a great, great committee. Okay, the 2011-12 general fund budget. Stefan. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Richardson. Uh, tonight's presentation of the general fund budget is the final budget area of the district that we will be presenting to you prior to returning on June 13th and asking for your adoption of the, the full budget, the comprehensive budget document. Um, as you are all well aware, we've been working on this portion of the budget for several months now. So really uh, what I'll be providing you with is just recapping um, what we've gone through the last few months where we started and then the financial summary of that work. Uh, back in January we met, to, uh, we began the process with a meeting of the Finance Advisory Committee and at that time the state was facing an unprecedented six billion dollar budget deficit or in excess of six billion dollars. It's since improved to five billion dollars but as, it, as we all know there um, Today being the deadline, there's no solution to a balanced budget. As the Finance Advisory Committee worked through the data, looked at a lot of historical information, um, it was a recommendation of that committee to plan for the worst case funding scenario that we would potentially uh, recognize from the state. And we'll talk about that worst case scenario in just a moment. Um, it was also the recommendation at that time to plan for a spend down of the fund balance to a level of 16% of operating expenditures and to plan on the estimated expenditure increases that were proposed within the assumptions and I'll lay those out for you in just a moment. Um, the first step in, in the budget preparation is really to look at our enrollment forecasts and um, there's several calculations that are done to our base pupil count. Right now we have approximately 3,850 students um, after we average that attendance out throughout the year and we weight them according to grade level, um, we, we get up to um, 4,426 students for 11-12. And this is really the multiplier for all of our funding, our formula revenues, um, with the exception of our referendum, which is based on resident pupil units. Uh, but the last five years, as, as we've looked back, the, the enrollment has been fairly stable. Um, we are predicting just a slight decline as we go forward. Um, but we, we, this is the enrollment numbers that we have used in our projection. So that worst case scenario that, we, uh, that I just mentioned was to um, calculate a decrease of basic per pupil formula of $500. Now this was with the prediction that the state may look at K-12 education, being that it makes up approximately 40% of the state's budget, that they may look at K-12 education to try to capture $1 billion worth of savings to go towards their budget deficit. And if they were to do that, one way that would translate into K-12 is for $500 per pupil approximately. So that is what we moved forward with for our planning purposes. Um, that overall represents approximately 5% decrease in total general fund revenue. On the expenditure side of the equation, we have our salary assumptions, our salary increases 
um, defined at approximately one and a half to two and a half percent across all salary lines. Our health insurance, which we've been talking about um, and we'll discuss a little bit more um, in, in moments after this presentation, is predicted to increase at approximately seven and a quarter percent, and that's throughout the forecast. Our non salary and other operational costs have a, a two percent inflationary factor, which creates the two point four five percent aggregate increase overall in our expenditures built into our forecast. And again, I mentioned um, the recommendation was to plan to spend down the fund balance to 16%, not below 16%. So this is the forecast that we looked at back in January, and uh, I'll just you know recap how this is laid out. This first column here is the current budget year, the 10-11 budget year. Um, we have our beginning, the, the second column in is what we're planning for in the, the next upcoming budget year. And we have our estimated beginning unreserved fund balance at the top, um, followed by two rows of revenues. And you can see our first row of approximately 38 point, or $30.8 dollars in state, federal, and other revenue. The bulk of that is um, made up of state revenue, our, our main source. But you can see the, the decline with that projection of the $500 decrease per pupil. Um, that's the main driver of dropping that $32 million number down to $30 million. The next line down is our referendum revenue. Um, and you can see we have that predicted to go up to the thir um, fiscal year 13-14 when that expires. Uh, so there'll be a dramatic decrease should that not be renewed by the voters at that time. The next line down, the, the fourth row actually, is our expenditure line. And what we have there, that 2.45% aggregate increase, we can see the, the expenditures increasing each year. And now what this model does is it assumes that we are implementing the cuts that are defined on this bottom here. So it adjusts these expenditures in the subsequent year with, along with the inflationary factor. So it's the inflationary factor and then reduced back down. Um, so the first orange bar here is really what the structural deficit would look like um, should our costs increase at the level that we have predicted and the revenues decline at what our assumptions are. This then um, means this is how we arrived at um, utilizing approximately $1.7 million of the fund balance and having approximately $705,000 remaining of budget adjustments that needed to be made. Um, so I just wanted to show this to you as a refresher from we looked at back in January. Um, again, this is another slide that we looked at, but the importance of the, the fund balance and where it, how it's progressed and improved over the last six years is really um, the reason why we had been able to absorb predicted decreases in revenues. And while early predictions don't look like they're near the $500 per pupil, um, our alternative best case scenario was that it would be held, we may be held harmless. Uh, we're quite certain we would be somewhere in between. Early predictions are looking, at our estimates are looking at categorical aid and, and some shuffling between various components. And so with this, um, back to this um, worst case scenario on the funding situation, it is the, the improvement in the financial stability and the fund balance that allowed us to plan throughout this year um, utilizing the, the, the fund balance. Um, <clears throat> our revenue summary, just breaking it down between local property taxes, state aids, federal aids, tuitions, you can see remained fairly consistent. That first column there is our audited financial revenues from fiscal year 10. Again, the middle column is, is the current budget year that we're in and the proposed 11-12 uh, revenues incorporate that reduction in state aid. This is just a, a breakdown of <clears throat> how that looks broken between state sources, federal sources, and local property taxes other. Typically, our state sources make up about 75%. With this reduction we have predicted, this is um, showing our, our state sources it would drop down to 70%. The proposed expenditure budget, um, this is by program area, 
And again, our audited financial numbers are in the first column there. Our current budget year is in that middle column. And then the proposed expenditure um, budget for 11-12 is in this far right column. And you can see all of the uh, program areas with the exception of the district support services are increasing. But again, they are um, not increasing by the full amount of that aggregate cost increase because we've, we've predicted those cost increases uh, at the 2.45% aggregate, but those, the budget reductions that were approved back in April by the board have then been incorporated in here. So some of these areas, these program areas are seeing less um, than that amount of increase. This just gives you a picture of how it's broken down by program area. Um, we like to benchmark how much of our funds are being used for direct instruction. And this 80.3% is actually direct instruction and instructional support. Um, one thing to note on the bottom here, pupil support services, this is a definition, uh, a program definition by the state. It does include uh, transportation costs and our transportation costs are approximately $2 million. So that is included in that this um, 80%. These other non-direct instruction and, and instructional support uh, areas, program areas are on the left-hand side here. And the one area that I wanted to note or point out is the operation and maintenance area does include our uh, capital levy referendum of $750,000 that was approved at the same time as our, our uh, general operating referendum. And that is due to expire in the same fiscal year as well as the operating referendum. So just to give you a picture of the, the fund summary, um, really down in the bottom right corner here is where we would, uh, it reflects the spend down of the fund balance. The estimated $7.5 million would be drawn down to approximately $5.8 million with those revenues and expenditures that I just um, had, had shown you. So just to, to reemphasize the early discussions that are coming out of the legislative session in the governor's office do not have uh, revenue or funding cuts um, close to the 500 per pupil um, reduction, which is a very, very good thing. And, but at this point in time, we just don't know where they will land. Uh, the last, I, there may have been movement this today yet. The last, no, <laughs> I'm seeing the head no. shake, no. Um, I had heard over the weekend the the House, Senate, and Governor's Office were still one and a half billion dollars apart in, in balancing the budget, with today being the deadline. Um, so so good news, bad news. Um, we did we did plan for the worst case scenario. Nothing presented thus far in any of the bills is near that level. There there is. Um, proposed revenue reductions that we would have to accommodate. So we don't, we can't necessarily say that we would be at that best case scenario where we're held harmless. Because you can see if if we did uh, see or uh, we we received a $500 per pupil cut, we would be looking at dramatic cuts next year because we just wouldn't have the fund balance to to spend down anymore. That would be a one-time spend down. Um, held harmless, we would have resolved the issue with the process we went through this year and we would not have to uh, go through a budget reduction process. Um, where that lands is to be continued. We'll, we'll have to revisit. But once the legislature does, uh, they do balance their budget and they finalize that, um, what I would estimate is we would be back before you with a budget amendment to adjust those revenue expenditures. And again, then that would, um, excuse me, those revenue projections. And at that time, if, if there's no additional amendments on the expenditure side, that would just be an increased fund balance at that point in time. And I think, yeah, that is it. I'll be happy okay. to answer any questions if you have any. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Anyone here? Ellen. So if I'm understanding correctly, if we're held harmless, we would still be um, using the fund balance as we decided, and we would still be making the bu budget reductions for the 2011-2012 school year. Is that correct? Correct. OK. The, um, the, the one thing that we're required to do is statutorily adopt our budget by June 30th. Mm -hmm. And so by June 13th, the last board meeting is when we will need to adopt that budget. So without any defined budget solution at this point at the state level, 
there's nothing really we could bring back to you um, unless, you know, a miracle happens in the next few hours. We could work on trying to adjust these numbers and present you with, uh, with an adjusted budget document on the 13th. But at this point in time, it's, it's based on the finance advisory recommendation from January. So I, I think the key piece that Stephanie shared with you is that we are kind of prepared for the worst case scenario if we have to take the full cut, if, they, if everything falls apart and people start fighting about where's the money gonna come from and, and so then education as well as other areas end up as targets, then we at least are ready to cover the entire next year without cutting again before next year but we would be facing another major cut for 2012-13. As Stephanie shared with you, the, the alternative is if we get somewhere close to a neutral budget for this coming year, then the cuts we've made have positioned us so that we would not make cuts for the 12-13 year, and the next set of cuts wouldn't occur till 2013-14. The bottom line, however, is even in that best case scenario, that's five years of no funding increases for education. And that's, that's gonna be the, the major stumbling block no matter how we go forward is that uh, the, the costs of basically educating students, the support that we have to provide, there is an increase in doing business every year to make that happen. So with no new funding for a five year period, which is kind of what we're saying is the best case scenario we could have, there still will be cuts. The only difference is, will we need to make cuts next year for the following year, or will we have a reprieve of a year before we have to make cuts again? John, did you? Uh, Chris, isn't there a worse, a worse case scenario a worser, than, than, a than case your worst scenario? case scenario? The, the, if there's uh, not just a, a funding cut, but also the, the failure to pay back the shift, which it sounds like, I've, I've been out of town for the last week, so I'm not entirely clear what's going on, but it sounds like the legislature is thinking that that shift, which would be more like $700 per pupil, might just be a, a, a cut. I see, I haven't heard that either on the legislative side. In fact, in the omnibus bill, it, they made the shift permanent. And making it permanent is not making it a cut. That what that in making the shift permanent, what they've said is, we're, we're going to continue to pay you at 70-30, but you can continue to carry that in your budget as resources that you're going to have. So instead of just coming in and saying we're going to make the shift a cut, which would mean a immediate cut of a much larger amount, by doing a shift, which is very similar to what they've done at least two times in the past. What they've basically done is put us in a position where there's a promise to pay it back when they have the available dollars to do so. Uh, we have had one situation in Minnesota where my understanding is we went, I think, almost 12 years with the shift in place before the shift was paid back. And that was back, I think, 80s into the 90s. And then we had a, had a shorter one that occurred uh, back actually in the 90s that they didn't get us back to the 9010 until uh, several years ago. And then we've now turned around in the last four or five years and gone right back into a larger shift level. So right now I'm not hearing from either the governor's office or from the legislature that they would, they are talking about changing the shift to a cut. They're just talking about making it permanent. And making it permanent means that it's now build into the budget as that shift and with the promise that it would be paid back when dollars are available. When dollars are available or in the next, in the following biennium? No, or? they're actually just saying when dollars are available. Uh, even the governor has gotten off of the, we're gonna try to pay it back right so away. They, everybody understands that there's not any money to do it immediately. So if the state wins the lottery, they might pay it back. Yes, or, or we strike oil. In, in, in downtown Minneapolis. And that's not uncommon, that's happened before. No, I, I, that's, exi that's, exactly, that's exactly what they've done in the past. And again, eventually they do pay it back. The, the only problematic piece about paying it back is not that they pay it back, I mean, that's great, because that means we need less cash flow, we need less reserve to be able to fund things. Right now we need 
a significant amount of fund balance just to cover the fact that we're always behind on payments. But um, the, the other piece that's there is that typically in the past when the legislature and the governor have actually paid it back, they will tout it as an increase of funding to education. And it really is not an increase in funding to education. All they're doing is paying back a piece of the IOU. And they will say, gee, we, we put $200 you know, back in, in a, you know, per pupil in, in education funding. Well, $200 back when they owed you 500 still leaves you with a $300 deficit. So um, as long as they can be truthful when they share that with the, with the public about how that works, it's great. But we will always take a, a shift, even a permanent shift, quote unquote, in, in anything in government being permanent. I will always take a permanent shift over any kind of a real cut. Anyone else questions? So, if a miracle happens, <laughs> the budget that comes to us on June 13th might be different, but most likely this is what we'll be approving because we have to have our budget set before we know what the legislature is doing. Correct. Most likely it will be a, a comprehensive look at all of the budget yeah. presentation and data that you've been supplied over the last several board meetings. Mm -hmm. um, if, if something were to happen in the next couple days, yeah. it, it, that's probably what it would take to get a new, um, new parameters built right. into the budget right. document. Uh, hopefully we would be revisiting very early in fiscal year 11-12 um, to provide you with an amendment to, mm -hmm. to this current situation or this current picture. Yeah. Okay, thank you Stephanie. Yep. And now you're going to want to stay there, aren't you? Because um, at our last meeting, we had information presented on the proposed budgets for the capital and health and safety budgets, and we're um, being asked to approve these tonight so that we can get moving on projects that need to be completed during the summer months. I don't know if you want to just revisit those or how we're going to do this. Um, you know, I think it, it's only if you have questions, specific okay. questions. Um, okay. Otherwise, uh, I had nothing further to add. Okay, yeah. so these are the, the budgets that were presented at our last meeting, um, um, outlining the, the, um, the budget for the capital and health and safety fund. And um, they'll be presented as part of the comprehensive budget at the next meeting, but we're being asked to approve them tonight so that you can get going on, on those summer projects. Correct, so we can okay. enter into to contracts with those. Yes. Um, yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our questions, I believe, were answered at our last meeting, but I would ask for a motion to approve the proposed 11-12 um, operating capital and health and safety budget. So moved. moved. Well, who wants it? Second. We'll give it to Ann and the second to Julie. Okay. Um, anyone have any further discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor of approving the 11-12 um, operating capital and health and safety budget, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Thank you. And then we're on to the self-funded health insurance plan, which we heard a lot about last time, and we'll hear more about tonight. Good evening, everyone, and I've got some compatriots here. As you remember, Tim Moore from Corporate Health Systems, and of course, you know Stephanie. And want to point out, we have a couple of our uh, district ad benefits advisory uh, board members here. Uh, Carol Beamer representing our educational assistants, and uh, Kevin Larson, um, director of buildings and grounds, who served for a number of years on the St. Olaf Benefit Advisory Committee during his tenure there and has brought great insight to our committee. And he may very well be the, the biggest champion of our self-funded proposal. So Kevin is here and, and uh, excited to have him here as well. And just, I, we included a document in the board packet and I'm just going to just quickly um, review it. In there, we just talk about what the change in self-insurance would mean from a, for, as compared to a fully insured program. And, and when we boil it down, it comes to the fact that every month we pay our claims as they actually are, not as what the bill would be from a fully insured company, whether we spent the money or not. If, I think when we boil it down to a nutshell, that's really what it comes down to. Um, again, we talked about why we've been interested in this as a benefits advisory committee for several years, well before my arrival here, um, the belief that we can do some rate stabilization over time. 
as you well know, over the past years, we've had dips, peaks and valleys in our health insurance renewals. And our hope is that by self-funding, we would be able to even those out, make them more predictable for our employees, and try to get that stabilized. We also believe that it would be good to keep the money that is ours. And over the past several years, uh, in fact, over the last five years, we've left money on the table, so to speak, in our current arrangement, where if we compared and were self-funded during that time, we could have built about a $1.8 million reserve. And Tim Moore did the calculations on that, keeping all other things equal. You know, our, did we have to pay the stop loss insurance versus what we pay to our current provider, et cetera? And that's what we believe is our would be the estimate of what we would have put in reserve over the last five years. Um, we've also had really great success with the dental self-insurance program. We've not had a rate increase since 2006-7 while our benefits have actually increased. Uh, and so the fact is that while health and dental are very different, um, we have a positive feeling from the dental experience over the last several years. And again, corporate health has really uh, been instrumental in helping us with that. And again, you'll just re remember that we talked about the fact that we had this window of opportunity because of the fact that our renewal rates came in so low under uh, where we would actually take a decrease in our rates where we would be able to move to this self-funded piece without an increase in premium. That's been a big hurdle for a number of years. And when you talk to other districts, which we did extensively, um, who have gone self-funded, that's been their biggest hurdle, starting to build that reserve in their first year. I mean, most places had to do some kind of rate increase uh, or premium increase in order to do that. And so we're happy that we would be able to do that without having to increase it. We did a couple of things just to gather some data. We did a survey, an online survey with the Minnesota Association of School Personnel Administrators. And then um, through that survey, which I didn't have a ton of response from, we had three districts respond. We found other districts who are self-funded. We made phone calls to those folks and we got some really good information from them in terms of the things that have been successful, the things that have not been successful. And every one of them to a T said, we're very happy we chose to do this and we, we don't plan on changing from that strategy. But because we're good researchers, we did dig up one place that had had some difficulty uh, approximately a decade ago where they had gone self-funded and then they actually reverted to fully insured. And there was a number of circumstances there and Tim and I really extensively reviewed this case, um, uh, a district in our region, and we believe that we have covered the various pieces that caused them to have some difficulty, uh, specifically that we are purchasing a mature contract, which I'll have Tim talk about in just a moment as well. So we've tried to make sure we ask the questions of people who've been successful, and we've also asked the questions of people who we think, uh, or who, the, per, the one group that we knew that was not successful. Again, trying to learn from their experience and say, what would you do, our questions, what would you do differently now that you know what you know? And after all those discussions, we feel like we've answered those questions and are, are ready to move forward. Another piece that we're excited about this is our quality consultant. Corporate health systems, we pay them to advise us on what they think the best situation is for our district. They don't, whether we were to choose to stay, you know, to go with a fully insured plan, stay where we are, or go to a self-insured plan, they get the same amount of money from us. So uh, corporate health has helped a number of districts, and I know that Tim has actually made recommendations to other districts who've been looking at self-funding to say, not the right time for you to do that. So we feel like we're getting great professional advice from people who do this every day. It's what they do, it's what they do well. And we're very thankful for that. So that is just a really kind of an overview of the document that I gave you in my New York 65 mile an hour minute mode here. And uh, I'm gonna just ask if Tim wants to just say a few words here and then we'll take any questions and we've got Stephanie here to answer all the, the dollar questions as well. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Uh, two things that we really look at when we look at self-funding is making sure that you've got a mature contract so that we are buying the best protection that is available out there. And if this doesn't work, then we've also got protection if we want to walk away from self-funding so that there is no risk or minimal risk to the school district. Uh, so those are the things that we do look at to make sure that that is correct. And like I say, we have no skin in the game to speak of other than it is our reputation. And so that's important to us at Corporate Health Systems to make sure that this is the right time and the right place and that you've got things and you're funding correctly. And that people understand that that reserve that's going to be built or has the potential to be built is only there for the health insurance. It cannot be used for anything else. I mean, that comes right from Darcy Heitzman and Associates. Uh, we had them review for all of our school districts and get 
their opinion on that. So that, that money has to be there, and we're going to tell you where you need to fund to. And if you don't fund there, that's when the issues come about, and that's where one of the school districts that had an issue. Uh, but that, you know, appropriate funding and the appropriate uh, reinsurance contract. So with that, are there any questions? Okay. Anyone have questions? I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, in reading the materials that you had last time, and I seem to remember Stephanie saying that the aggregate amount that we want to um, build up before we go into that aggregate stop loss is 525000 That's 125% of the expected claim. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. And, and because um, if we maintain premiums at the level they're at now, <coughs> because of the dip in, in um, the, the way the bids came in. Mm -hmm. We've got this cushion, mm -hmm. and that's what we use to build towards that 525. Correct, that's exactly right. And that in that first year, it gets us to close uh, to 400, was it? In the first year with that seven and a quarter percent increase, it was um, more in the neighborhood of about 300,000. Okay, and then in the second year, Presumably, we keep those steady, and we still have enough of a cushion that that we think by the second year we'd be up to that 525. Is that yes, the yes. expectation? And and really, it's um, <clears throat> it's th that pool of money is really for risk management. It's not for certain that that would be spent. Right, it's, but that's the that's the amount of money out of which we would pay claims and build the reserve for those, those large losses? Uh, actually, if we, we have um, premium set at a, at a level that we would remain consistent this year to next year, yeah. and so if we, our claims came in at expected or below expected, we would actually build reserves just through that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the expected claims level up to 125% that we have exposure so if we never go above the expected claims, we would never pay or spend out that 500 and some thousand dollars. It's only for risk mitigation. It's, it's what our exposure is. And so if we didn't identify funds and all of a sudden we did go above 100%, you know, we would be strapped or struggling, where would we get the funding? But here we've identified the funding okay. to say, you know, again, worst case scenario, if we need it, we have, we can isolate these dollars within and earmark them within the general fund in the event that the worst case type scenario happens and we're exceeding our claims. Once we get up, if, if we got up to 125% and went over, then our reinsurance would kick in and pay for, for the claims above that. And at that point in time, what we would be doing, and we would be, this would be, all throughout the year is monitoring those claims and we would have to reevaluate where the premium levels are for the next year because all of a sudden if we had a, a year where our claims are coming in much higher than expected that's going to drive the premium levels just as it would if we're fully yeah. insured. Did I? Is, yes, it, you're okay. exactly right. Okay. I just want to kind of... Because I, I think, Carrie, to get back to the kind of the first piece, most of the, the initial claims are going to be paid for out of the dollars that we would otherwise been paying the monthly payment to the insurance company for fully funded insurance. And that's that lower premium that we would have if we went right. with a fully insured so, program. So, the, so it's the difference that's building up that. Yes. Correct. Okay. And so only if you go above the expected amount do you have to actually dip into or, or work from the reserve. And if in, in months that you don't hit the expected, or the amount that's the, the normal monthly premium, that's actually then money you're saving in the bank that, be, that becomes part of your reserve. And again, the key piece is, as Heitzman and Associates has indicated to us, those dollars, once they're saved, need to stay in that fund. So they become a, a reserved fund or a restricted fund that can only be used to either mitigate premiums somewhere down the road or to cover us if we have above the expected amount. Okay. So. John? And to be clear though too, that if we spend more than we've expected, uh, 
not only could we sp be spending part of that reserve, the amount that we would have to hold in reserve in future years could go up, right? I mean, it's, it's possible that we could wind up having to dig into our uh, our budget to, to pay for uh, claims that are coming out, plus to fund up more of a reserve, and the reserve that we have to have might increase as that as that changes too. Yes, that would be true because our, our claims level, which is based on, there's several different calculations or ways you can calculate it. Um, one typical way is a 24 month rolling average. So that would increase if we have a year that has high claims, that's gonna get rolled into what drives our premiums. We would then have to look at premium rates going forward and what that cost is. Um, it would be un, unlikely to continue, especially looking historically at how our data looks, it would be unlikely to continue to climb each year. So the potential to, you know, that could occur is you increase your premiums, then all of a sudden in the subsequent year, your claims drop down to the normal level or a more reasonable level, and then you've, you've built that reserve again. But you're right, by the nature of the 125%, when our expected claim level goes up, that's going to drive what that, you know, the 25% cap is. So if the bird flu gets here next year or something, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that could really mess up all these projections. And one of the things that we provide at Corporate Health Systems on a monthly basis is a report so that we know exactly where you're at. So we look at the claims and where the cap is. We also look at where expected is, and we're going to track that every month for the district and provide that for them so that they can see every month how do we sit every month and then from there we'll project out what the next year's renewal will be as well. Okay. Julie. Um, I think John just made a really good point because Stephanie and I were speaking about that before the meeting that it has to be an aggregate amount of claim not just one catastrophic claim and, and that just I just realized that after you explained that I was born thinking it's an aggregate and to John's point it or it's one claim, it's really aggregate claims that would take you, like the bird flu. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, that, that was a f good point of clarification. Yeah. That, that actually was another question I had, because you've got the specific stop loss, and then you've got the aggregate stop loss. And the, the and, and presumably then we would have both kinds of reinsurance there. Correct. Okay, so the specific stop loss is if you have an individual who has um, a, a very catastrophic medical event. Catastrophic, we'll use like a premature baby. You know, it's a half a million dollars, so. That and and so have we set that dollar amount per individual, or is that something that would be negotiated in the insurance um, in these, these later things as we decide to move forward? Is no, that we've got, um, actually, the, the number we're looking at is $100,000 right now, and so that's a very low, um, we, uh, some other districts that we talked to, they started that low. It costs more, of course, sure. you know, to have that lower level of specific stop loss. But other districts who've been successful have started at the lower piece. As they build their reserves and feel more comfortable with that, then they renegotiate that particular specific stop loss piece to a higher level, mm -hmm. reducing, the, reducing what you have to pay for the specific stop loss. So a couple of districts who've been in this for more than a decade, their specific stop loss is now over $200,000. The $100,000, I think we, the group looked at and Tim suggested to be very conservative to make sure that we're handling those kinds of pieces early on. Okay, and then when, what kind of number are you looking at for the aggregate stop loss? The aggregate is a combination based on that. Uh, you're probably looking at about uh, 39, 38 roughly 3.8, 3.9 million dollars. So when you look at that, what happens is, is all the claims underneath the $100,000 go towards that aggregate. And so the chance, that's an expected level, and then they add 125% on top of that. So you'd have to have a pretty bird flu example, catastrophic issue where everyone in the school got sick, all members, all family members, those types of things. And it's highly unlikely that you We'll go through that. But. but I think it's important to, to say that we plan for that, you know, in terms yeah. of because that 125%, I think, you know, Stephanie's really outlined that to build that reserve, we've got the, the difference between the 7.5% reduction we could have taken in claims versus the zero, yeah. plus the addition of some additional percentages that have been budgeted and planned 
you know, and then that this is where the position of financial strength with our fund balance comes into play is the fact that we feel comfortable that if we were to have that catastrophic year in our first year, we're in a financial position where we would be able to do that. Though Tim assures us that, you know, if you look at our history, you look at our data, and over the years, I think this is an important thing to point out that many of the other things that happen to districts where they get those crazy swings, our district benefit advisory committee has addressed over a number of years. One of the biggest issues is what they call adverse selection of plans. So I pick a plan that maybe isn't quite as um, robust maybe as some of the others or doesn't hand, and we, we are now down to two plans, which it wasn't that long ago that, were we at five plans, Chris, at one point? Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, from, so we're down to two Cadillac plans. Through, through everything else. You know, and so I think that over the years, the reason that the actual claims to expected claims ratio is, is in really good line is that the District Benefit Advisory Committee, led by Molly Eastland, you know, has really done some great work in taking a look at the data, consulting with Tim and saying, here's where we can make adjustments to our plans to make sure we keep things in line. And we think that that's an important piece. Did you say that right, Tim? Yes, okay. you did. You hit it right on the button there. I can't stress that enough of how the Benefit Advisory Committee has stepped up and made changes to your plan over the years to help control costs. And we'll continue to do that so that we don't have these catastrophic uh, or larger uh, impact to you as far as premiums go. That will be another thing that we'll continue to look at as a consulting basis. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Questions? Jeff? You probably mentioned this before, but as far as comments specific or non-specific specific to other school districts, um, can you comment more on success stories and failures, or is that...? Sure. Um, you know, we talk with a number of districts, uh, and in fact, um, I'll give you what I think is one of the silver bullets that came out of that piece, which is the districts who've been very successful have said that a number, quite a bit of education needs to be done of a, the employee group to because once they get that we're, you know, we're paying the actual bills and they realize that by managing my own health care, I am going to really have a direct impact on our rates increase or decrease, those districts said that they've seen some wonderful things happen in terms of people making really good choices about using things like the nurse line rather than going into the emergency room initially. We have a committee that is set to do that. That's the, what this committee is, is. There's a lot of veteran members on it. They are ready to educate. They talk about the wellness program. Our wellness program has been outstanding where people come to us and they come to Molly and say, what are you guys doing that you have such high percentage participation in your wellness program? So we've got a number of those things that we're hearing from other people who've been successful that we have in place and we think the committee has said that they're ready to take that to the next level. So I think those are the couple things I learned from other places. Really the place that um, we learned the most from you know, was the place that did not was not successful and again, they have 2020 vision looking back. And when we look at the different things that they did, um, they had a plan issue where they had a plan that wasn't being, uh, the, the premium wasn't high enough to actually cover it. It was a contractual issue that they were working through. They should have probably eliminated a plan at that time. It does not appear to us that they did a mature contract. So um, that was a problem that we have addressed up front. So as we talk to the other folks that um, have done this, we believe that we are emulating the best of what they have, and we're also learning from the areas that um, others have not done well. One other area that was problematic, they've still been self-insured for more than a decade now, but initially that particular district had a practice where at the end of their fiscal year in June, we, pay, we can give our employees a lump sum at that point, we pre-charge them for their insurance premiums. This is a relatively large district that did not do that, and they had a lot of movement from the district in the summer. So the employees had the health insurance through the end of the summer, but hadn't paid the premiums up front. So if they took a job or another, now that was an accounting issue that they still <coughs> solved many years ago, but we don't do that. You know what I mean? So when we look at the things where people have not been successful um, in the six or eight districts that I've talked to pretty extensively, we feel like we've covered those bases. Now, is that to say there's not some crazy thing that could, no, there is, there's risk, which is why Tim and Stephanie have talked a lot about risk mitigation. But because of the work that the district's done, we are in a financial place where we can do this, and the hope is that long-term this will really let us take control of our own insurance increases and decreases, and that it will be a positive thing. John, did you? Matt, uh, in your memo, you've got two fractions here that I'm not clear what you mean. You, you said that the 
the, the stop loss is 12 18 and then for the second year it's 24 18 so what do you mean by that I'm gonna let Tim talk about that because he wrote that section yes uh, 1218 means that we have a plan that is an incurred and paid contract so it has to be incurred in the plan year which your plan year begins <coughs> September 1st runs through August 31st so the claim has to incur in that time period and then we've got a six-month protection so if a claim comes in on the last day of the plan year that's a million dollar claim we've got six months to get that claim in and get it processed and paid so it get, goes against that contract that particular year we go to the second year now now we have a 24 12 it's got to be incurred in the 24 months and paid in the 18 excuse me a 24 18 excuse me it's a 24 18 it's got to be incurred in 24 months so it's going to cover the 12 months of the first year it's going to cover 12 months of the current year and it's going to have this what we call a tail or run out provision in there so that if we want to move to fully insured we've got protection if we've got a claim that comes in at the last minute we've got protection and then what happens is on the third year it goes to a 3618 contract so that at all times we're protected not only from a claim that maybe occurred uh, two years ago that didn't get in for some odd reason we're also protected in case there's a large claim that happens at the end of the plan year the average claim average claim takes 30 to 60 days to get in if it is a hospital claim it will take approximately 90 days and I have seen them take longer than that but that's where we get involved and try and find out where that occurred and trying to encourage that uh, hospital to pay that get that claim in we don't know who it is we just call on your behalf and say we're self-funded we want that claim in they're willing to pay it today if you can get it in today and those are the things that we step up to the plate on behalf of you to make sure there are no claims that are lagging out there so the reinsurance then covers us for those losses uh, those catastrophic losses in in that location. on an individual basis and then all claims underneath that specific stop loss level that gather in this other bucket and then there's a level on that as well Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Julie. So if we were to <coughs> approve this tonight, I understand then that the employees have the open enrollment period. And then um, it, the, um, what will happen is the premiums will be the same as the prior year. Is there any chance that the level of benefits would increase or they would be the same with the same premium? The goal is to be the same with the same premium. Okay. And then, and, and if we did approve this tonight, then you would go forth and negotiate <coughs> the reinsurance contracts and that sort of thing. Those contracts then would come back to the board at a later time to be approved. Is that correct? So what we what we'd be doing tonight is approving the concept of of going self insured. John, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, just to follow up on what Julie just said, because um, so. Will this be our only health plan, or will we have a, a number of options for the employees to choose from? There's currently two options, two different plans within the overall health insurance package that we have. And those would remain? They remain They just the would same. be self-insured now? Correct, correct. So there, it would still be self-insurance, it's just there are two different plan administrators that we might have for them. Same administrator. Same we administrator. would have the same administrator, but there's two two different um, plans that employees can choose from. A higher deductible plan or an HRA plan. Um, so they have those same choices, um, same, same deductible level, same out-of-pocket, all of those types of things would remain the same. So um, it would be um, very transparent, or, you know, transparent to the, to the employees. They wouldn't be impacted in that way. Um, and, and maybe if I could just jump back, Carrie, to what you mentioned, um, we would be then bringing that forward to the board, ultimately what would be negotiated, although timing is a little tricky at this point because we do have open enrollment, so we would need to actually start that open enrollment process, oh, yes. and yeah. um, it would be June 13th then that we would be able to 
um, present to you what what was yes. finalized. But just to be clear, we would be in that open enrollment phase. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, what we've asked for is the ability to authorize us to negotiate and enter into an agreement. Yes. Mm -hmm. with and we don't even know what the, who the provider will be as of yet. Yes. And just to step back, Jeff, one of the things that you had asked about, you know, success stories. I can give you one that I can think of offhand. I've got many of them, but one is phenomenal for us as a consulting firm. We stepped into a situation at Robbinsdale School District. They were fully insured, and every year they went out to the marketplace and got a proposal and moved, and the carriers tracked that. And so come a year in which they're supposed to get over a 50% increase, the market was unwilling to look at them. So we brought self-funded to the table. We had never been a, their consultant. This was four years ago. Walked in there with self-funding and the concept. Told them where they needed to fund, which was a 30% increase the first year and a 30% the second year. This is given to the employees two years in a row. The second year was zero. They're actually looking at a reduction. The reserve is $7 million in four years, which is phenomenal. You know, now granted, they were a larger school district, so uh, about 13, 1,500 uh, employees, so that's, you know, a great success. But if we can mimic that, that is our goal. We do Wyzetta, uh, like in Edina, look, looking at it, uh, Carver Scott, Bloomington has went to it two years ago, uh, Carver Scott, or Eastern Carver Eastern County. Eastern Carver. Yeah, I remember. I might should know that one. Lived there, but uh, they looked at it. They decided not to. Farmington looked at it, decided not to. But they also all of these school districts have said, don't, don't you know, just because we haven't gone to it, don't leave it off the table when we come forward. So those every school district is looking at it this year for us. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, the superintendent's recommendation is for a motion to authorize administration to negotiate and enter into a self-funded health insurance plan as presented to the board at the May 9th school board meeting, effective for the 2011-12 health insurance plan year. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved, moved by John, is there a second? Jeff? Any further comments, questions? Julie? I just had a comment. Um, the, the amount of information you've given us has really been great. And I so appreciate the due diligence and especially your thorough and complete analysis of the risks. I mean, it really has been very, very informative and makes me feel really comfortable about moving forward. Anyone else? Okay, ready to vote? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you all very much. <coughs> um, at our last meeting, Hannah Puchko brought us um, language to add to the procedures of facility use policy 902. And, and as you know, we don't typically approve um, procedures to policies, but because that involved fees, um, administration felt it was appropriate to bring that before the board. And so I would ask for a motion to approve that language in um, the language addition to facility use policy 902. Um, implementing those fees for um, those various electronic and uh, audiovisual um, equipment. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Moved by Noel. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ann. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving that language addition to policy 902 say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Um, on to the consent grouping, and I do want to remind you there were a number of items in the table file to be added to the consent grouping, including a um, number of personnel items and the Prairie Creek Charter School contract, which would renew our um, sponsorship of them for five years. Is there anything anybody would like to pull from the consent grouping? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? So moved. Moved by Ellen. Is there a second? Seconded by Ann. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Items for information. Um, we have the, the visitor and volunteer guidelines and the classroom observation and volunteer confidentiality acknowledgement. 
These are two documents that were developed by the superintendent's cabinet um, as procedures to policy 903, which um, covers visitors to the school building and sites, and they're going to be um, beginning to be used next year. I think these are very good policies. They've been sort of informally in place, but I think it's, it's good to formalize those procedures. I think that's really valuable for our many visitors and volunteers. Um, we've got the school board meeting schedule for July 11 through June of 12. And a reminder that graduation is on Sunday, June 5th at 2 o'clock. I think you all got the memo telling us when and where to be. And um, we all have our robes. Anybody has lost theirs from last year? Tell them to meet us quick. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> uh, I thought I checked it. I think that you have. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, graduation on June 5th. We've got one meeting in June on June 13th and a second uh, meeting or first, uh, no second meeting in June and one meeting in July on July 11th. Two weeks. I should just point out, because <coughs> Dr. Richardson mentioned the ALC graduation on oh, Wednesday, yes. June 1st at mm -hmm. 1 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. And a large class this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is a, that's a great event. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so personal and so meaningful yeah. and, and um, it's re really a fun event. And with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Moved by Noel. Is there a second? Second. Second by Julie. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. And we are adjourned. <laughs> 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 <laughs>